Welcome to the How to Scale Commercial Real Estate Show. Whether you are an active or passive investor, we'll teach you how to scale your real estate investing business into something big. Hey, Mitch, welcome to the show. I'm doing good, man. How are you doing, Sam? I am great. Thanks for taking the time to jump on with us today. I'm excited about this interview. You have done uh, an, an incredible, diverse, you know, you built an incredibly diverse portfolio. And I just kind of want to hear your story of where you started, where you are now, and how you got there. All right. This can be hard to cram into 15 minutes, Sam. Well, we're going to have to. I made, more, I made more than 15 days worth of mistakes if I started talking right now and didn't even stop. <laughs> <laughs> well, give us the highlights then. Maybe we'll come back and do episodes two and three later on. You know, like my book, My, my, my Life in a Thousand Houses, Failing Forward to Financial Freedom. I mean, my, I've fallen down so many times my nose should be flat. The secret was I just kept getting up, dusting myself off and saying, okay, that was painful. How do I stop that from happening again? And then being relentless and not stopping trying to figure out that until someone gave me the answer. So I'd go from door to door to house to house to knock on calling. This just happened to me. How come it happened to me and how do I stop it from happening? Or is it always going to happen? Or did I just get unlucky or what was the deal? Right. People would go start giving me the answers. And so I slowly started, you know, getting my armor, all the chinks out of my armor over the years, you know, so it gets to where you're kind of bulletproof which is never the point, but you can get closer to bulletproof. You're never going to be bulletproof because sure. you're always coming up with something else. But Right. So what are you investing in right now? Uh, well, it's like when people say, you know, what, what, what part of town do you, and say, I, I do all my investing in San Antonio, Texas, in our sure. say, Well, what part of town do you invest in? And I say the half price part of town. I don't <laughs> care where it is and I don't care what it is. If it's half price, I'll buy it. A Corvette, a house, you know, a rifle. I don't care what it is. A Rolex. If it's half price, I'm in, I'm buying it. Sure. I'm a deal junkie. I'm, I'm addicted. Like I'm. Gotcha. Addicted. Gotcha. But you've got a, a long history in residential in self-storage, yeah. in note so servicing. I mean, you've, you, you. I'll get back on track here. So, so I started out flipping houses because it had a high margin, you know, sure. um, I, it, it, 20 years ago, 24 years ago, I, 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 I could go in downtown San Antonio, houses for sale for 12, 10, 15, $20,000, which meant if you had good credit, you could apply for every credit card on the planet. And they would all, they just look at your credit, Back then, this is back then, not now. They just look at your credit, and if you had good credit, they'd send you the card with all the cash advance they had and everything. So I was walking around town with 45 credit cards going, I need 10,000 on this card and 10,000 on this card to buy that house, and I need 10,000 on this card to fix it up, and so I have 30,000 in credit cards on this house, and then I'd sell the house for 60,000 on a seller finance note, and then I'd sell the note for 50,000, and I'd walk out with 20 grand. I did it 400 times in a row. It almost got me divorced. Because <laughs> here's a lesson. This is like one thing you learn. Your wives are going to find out about everything. It doesn't matter. What I've been married a month. I haven't learned this yet. I think I'm going to hide this $250,000 worth of credit card debt from my wife by going to the mailbox early every day and getting the credit card bills. So you're Until not suggesting she, that. No, I'm not suggesting this at all. Until one day she finds it, you know, and, she, and, and I'm in the shower. And I hear this blood curdling scream and a couple of cuss words. And I run out with the towel wrapped around. You know how you do that tippy toe walk when you're wet? Like somehow that's going to stop the water from falling off you onto the floor. Right. And I look at my wife. She goes, Wells Fargo says we owe them friggin' $250,000. And I said, well, don't call. She's reaching for the phone. I said, don't call them. And wow. she just looked at me. And she, she literally got in the car. We, I, I had to go to to uh marriage counseling over it. And the ironic thing about that was we had to walk out. Of, she stormed out of that marriage counseling deal because after she presented her case, how I was gambling with her, her life, I presented my case, how it wasn't gambling, how I knew exactly what these houses were. I had $250,000 worth of credit card debt on $500,000 worth of houses. I'm fixing to liquidate. Right. Right. And then, and then the doctor, and his name was Dr. Love, and he was a marriage counselor, and he'd been divorced three times. So I figured he knew not what to do. Right. Um, 
Then he started talking to me about investing his money with me, and I flipped the tables on him. He was counseling me about marriage, and I started counseling him about his money, and then he wanted to invest with me, and that's when my wife walked out of that counselor session. <laughs> wow. So, you're, 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 you're batting a thousand there. I mean. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, and I just got in the elevator with her. I said, I'm sorry, honey. I'm so crazy and so in left field that people just really want to give me their money. Right. Well, I mean, you know, and, and, and for those of us who are in the business, like, yeah, I mean, I, I don't think you'd probably recommend someone rack up enormous amounts of credit card debt in order no, to get started. I, 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 no, you're absolutely wrong. If you know what you're doing and you know what you're, you're if you know what you're buying is worth a million and is going to be worth a million for any substantial amount of time, then I suggest you get 500000 on your credit card and buy it. All That's right, the that, difference between me and Dale Ramsey. Oh, uh, if you don't leverage it's going to be a long, 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 long road. And, and I understand there's some people that need the Dale Ramsey theory because they just don't know how to manage anything and they're not going to learn how to make their money grow. And they're not going to learn the difference between good debt and bad debt. And they don't, they don't have the discipline. Sure. Sure. Um, I have the discipline. I've been policing myself for 25 years. I never borrow more than 65% of what I can sell or finance a house for from any of my investors right now. Right this minute, I have $26 million I'm going to owe payments on on the first to private people at 8 and 9 and 10%. And I never let them in over 65%. I always, my appraiser and I fight for conservative 65%. I mean, I'm not pushing values. I'm like, I don't want to be in over 65 Right. If, I, if I'm going to buy a house for 70% of its value, then I got to put in 5% of my own cash because these private lenders are the world to me. And I've got to protect them. Right. Without them, I, I can come back from anything with these guys if they believe in me. But if I don't pay them, they're not. Right. And that's one of the questions we were going to get to is how you're funding your deals. So it sounds like you've, you've, you've really mastered the art of raising private money. Yeah. So, you know, I didn't start out getting 20 million. I started out with 50 and 30 and, and I started out with credit cards because no one would give me anything. And then as I right. kind of got a track record, which was wrong, I was under the myth that you have to have money to go buy these houses. It's the, the, it's the deal that brings the money. If I, if I, if I'd have been smart and if I'd have gotten a coach early on, I, it would have been explained to me that you get the deal under contract with 45 days to close and it's worth 200 and you only need a hundred to buy it. And you walk around with that, that deal and start showing people and you find the hundred thousand dollars because it's not a very risky loan for a person to loan you a hundred thousand dollars. If you, and if you don't pay them, they get a $200,000 house. That's not risk. Right. Right. That's, that, that's very interesting. I'd like to hear like, just as a side note for our listeners, when you're raising private money, what type of interest rates are you currently paying to your investors? Well, you know, I started out, uh, actually, I started offering too much and I would scare people that are going like, I'll pay you 15%. Right. They're like, shit, this is a scam. Right. No, run, run. So I learned early on, it says you can't offer them that much. So I'm paying eight, nine or 10%. I'm sure. paying 10% for a 15 year fully amortized loan. I'm paying 9% for a 10 year fully amortized loan. I'm paying eight and a half percent for a 15 year loan with a seven year balloon. I'm paying 8% for a 15 year loan with a five year balloon. But, um, but the main thing is they're non recourse collateral only loans. This is why right. I can sleep at night. It's like, I have two choices and I'll tell this to my private lenders every day of my life. I have the right to pay you as agreed, or I have the right to walk my position in this house over to you and hand it to you. Signed, sealed, delivered all straight up paperwork. Sure. Right. So if I own the house, I can walk the deed over to you. If I own a note, I can walk the note over to you. Uh, here's my promise. I'll, you'll never have to sue me or foreclose on me. If I don't pay you one month, if I can't pay you, which has never happened in my career, 2000 houses, a hundred houses a year, I owe 26 million. I've never not paid anyone. I've never given a house back. I've never been foreclosed on. I've never been chapter seven. I've never been chapter 13. Uh, knock on wood and by the grace of God, because it can happen to anyone. Sure. Right? sure. You know, who thought COVID? Right. You know, uh, so no, I don't, don't, I'm not invincible. I mean, good Lord wants to hit me with a lightning bolt or you or me or all of us. We're all going down. So, right. So, um, but I have, that's why I made it this way. It's non-recourse collateral only. And I have two rights every day, pay as agreed or hand you, hand you this, my position in this property, whatever it is. 
you'll never have to sue me, take me to court or anything. I'm not that guy. Right. You know, if I collect money on that house, I'm paying you. If, if, if all my houses went vacant and I couldn't, then I'm bringing everyone their deed or the, sure. or, or the, or the note or whatever. Right. And that's, and that's brilliant. You know, ha, ha, having that, that moral backbone is um, it's, it's a rarity these days. So good for you on that. But when, I set up the rules so that I could not, I could not fail my agreement. I cannot fail my agreement because the worst thing that happened is I have to go give everyone back, give the property that is their collateral. Right. Right. And you've set it up and you, and you, and you've set the, set the expectation on the front end that, Hey, if I can't pay you, I'm handing you the deed. Yeah. And, and, if, and if you don't like this property for this amount of risk and this interest rate, don't do it. Don't do it. Don't right. do it. Right. Absolutely. But you got to, people go, well, you know, they have to share in the downside with me. It'd have to be catastrophic. It would have to be catastrophic. Like King Jung dumbass would have to drop a dirty bomb, a nuclear bomb in downtown San Antonio for it to happen. I don't think it's going to happen. You don't think it's going to happen, but I'm not signing that it's not going to happen because I got no control over that. Sure, sure. I got no control. Now, as you've scaled, so you went out and you bought 400 houses, some on, I think it was on um, credit cards or, or something to that. Maybe by that time you were, you were lining up private lenders, but I've, you bought I've a- bought- I've bought about a house every four to five days in or about San Antonio, Texas for over two and a half decades. So I've bought about a hundred houses a year for over 20 years. It's about 2000 houses. So I know this business well, and I know what it'll take and what it won't take. And apparently it booms during COVID and it booms during recessions. Right. Right. And so you found not only um, your niche, but you've also developed the systems. I mean, you've got to have systems in place for you to be able to pull this off without, I mean, one closing for, for most people is, is, is an all in just mental exercise. And now what now, 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 now for you, I mean, you probably are buying houses and don't even know you're closing. Is that right? I got pulled over the other day. It's hunting season. The, the, the DPS man said, I handed in my concealed gun license and my license. Cause you have to present them both at sure. one time, you know, understood. Right. Law. And he goes, so where's your gun? And I said, well, I got three. He goes, where, where are they? And I said, well, one's in the console safe and it's locked. I think the other two are under the seat or they're under this seat or they're over there. And he goes, so you got three guns and you don't know, and you don't know where two of them are exactly. And I said, oh, it's way worse than that. <laughs> and he, he like looks at me and I, I said, yeah, I got, th- I got, I got four, I got 300 houses. I don't know where any of them are. <laughs> 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 I couldn't tell you the address of one of them. I don't know anything about it. Uh, if you're listening to this, that's brilliant. That's brilliant because you're listening to a guy who has figured out how to buy and make passive income off of assets that he knows absolutely nothing about. It's so, not exactly true, but I got people, I got the reports, but you know, I mean, if I, anytime I want them, I can get my hands on them. Sure. I just, I, you know, I have a system. My daughter's been in my central office for over 20 years. Wow. Uh, my partner, Mike Powell, um, you know, the greatest partner in the whole wide world, he's in charge of sales and acquisitions and I'm in charge of making sure that there's enough money to fund it. He's never had to worry about a dime. Wow. That's he awesome. Tells me, you know, we bought a six, he called me the other day, said, Hey, I got, I just got under contract a $650,000 place. I hadn't had time to talk to you about. And I said, what's it about? He says, we're going to make some semi truck parking. It'll hold 270 trucks. It'll make 30,000 a month. I said, uh, okay, go ahead. I didn't see that. I, I funded it and got everything done. And I didn't see it till, till one day when we were paving it. Wow. That's awesome. That's awesome. And, and, and it sounds like, you know, developing partnerships where you can divide responsibilities and you implicitly trust that partner has also been part of your success. So let's get to your audience in the, the deal of scaling. I'm going to put it in a nutshell. Okay. Yeah. I was 15 years in the business, give or take a few. I had been wearing every hat. Right. It's pretty much a one man show. I was so ineffective per task because I was responsible for every task. So even though I was great at this task, if you just leave me the hell alone, I was, I was wonderful at it. Sure. Uh, Given the fact that I couldn't sit down to do one thing without the phone ringing and I had to run to put out another fire, you know? So after 15 years, I'm about burned out. Right. I still got help. I got some office help. I got a secretary. I got some stuff, but I'm not, I'm not really, I, I, I'm, I'm working in my business still, not on my business. I'm still in it, which is, is the mistake in it. And I tried four or five times to get out of it and I failed. Mm. And then 
I was about to, at 15 years, I was going, you know what? I bought all these mini storages. I got 1,300 mini storage doors in 14 locations, okay? They all owe me 100 bucks a month. Do the math. I'm making $130,000 a month minus some overhead, okay? I don't need to work. I don't need to do this. I sure. don't need to do anything. And I was about had it one day, and I said, you know, I'm going to put all this house flipping in a box, and I'm going to put a ribbon on it, and I'm going to walk away from it because I'm damn burned out. I'm right. tired. I'm right. tired. I've already tried to fix it. I can't fix it. And then I couldn't, couldn't make myself give away a million plus net a year from the house flipping business. Right. I just could I said, you know, damn it. You should, you should be able to pay some people, you know, a collective $500,000 to make sure this runs and at least keep 500,000 a year. I mean, don't just go to zero, you know, like I have all this momentum. I have all this reputation. I've got all this knowledge and legacy knowledge. And I know this town backwards and forwards. I mean, and so I said, you know, I'm going to try one more time. This time I'm going to do it all different than last times, the last five times. One is I'm going to mastermind $30,000 for a mastermind. If it costs me a penny. Now the mastermind was only like 20, but then there's rooms and hotels. And when you go eat with rich guys, the bill's not a dollar 50. Okay. It's $500, you know, no matter where you go. And this is back when I was drinking and smoking. So, you know, hell I get happy and buy the whole bar around. So, uh, $30,000. I go there. It's for four meetings, one a quarter. You get your chair, you sit down. And in this room, I had verified there were people who had automated my business and they were doing way more than me. And they, they were on cruise ships and traveling the world and, 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 and had this air that they had spare time. So I said, I'm going to go meet these people. And of course, you have to, you have to get kind of everyone's uh, okay for it because you can't be in a com competing market and you can't be in a competing market with a competing strategy or else they don't want to show you their secrets. So sure. luckily for me, they weren't. And so I got invited to go. It was called Collective Genius. And I went and these people would just strip their businesses down and show you the inside guts of everything and who they paid and how they paid and why they paid and the commission scale and the whole thing. And, and then another guy would get up, same business, same business as mine again, and show me his, his was a little different. And I started to piece together how mine was going to work. Cause there's no one model for everybody's business. Everyone's different. Every market's different. Every people got different skills. I mean, sometimes you can set a guy in a chair and he can do three things. And sometimes you need three people to do the three things. Cause you know, they're just not as good as that one guy. Right. So I went home with Mike and Mike Powell and I, and we decided that we were going to step back and that we didn't care if we bought one house that year. And we were going to fix this business. And we started working one chair at a time and writing the training manual and getting the people and interviewing and then firing that person and getting another person and finally figured out number. Here's one thing. Don't hire and train people. Scalp people. Scalp other. Find the best in your area and steal them. Take them. Hire them away. Do not try to cultivate these people up from the grassroots. Find the best. Go talk to them. Bring them onto your team. That's brilliant. That's brilliant. So you guys, um, the one get them, get them to write the damn manual for the chair. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Excuse me. That's absolutely right. Yeah. You're not going to, you don't want to spend two weeks hammering out a uh, manual you for know. a position. Now, remember I was thinking about giving up $500,000. So I had a large budget, right? Right. And I wasn't afraid to. Well, so I did that. It ends up, ends up, I get it done. It takes about 14 months. I don't even go to the fourth meeting that I paid 30,000, you know, 25, 30,000 for because I'm so overwhelmed trying to get everything done that I learned in the first three meetings that I didn't need to go have another drink from a fire hose because I, I had already been saturated and I knew exactly what I needed to do. And I was right. on it. Right. So about 14 months into this thing, I got a business humming like a train down a track. Uh, and here's the kicker. I make more money now than I ever did. And they didn't cost me a penny because they are so good at what they do in their individual chairs and so focused because that's all they have to do is that one thing. Right. I was trying that, that we make more money now than we ever made. And I never, I, I didn't only, I not only didn't I not take a cut and pay, I made money. Wow. And I have a life and I have not seen the last 400 houses my company has bought. And I have not seen nor met nor shook the hand of the last 400 people that bought my houses. All I know is I got this spreadsheet with about 300 plus people that owe me a mortgage payment every month. 
and that mortgage payment averages about four seventy five. So do the math: three hundred times four hundred seventy five thousand dollars. What is that? One hundred and a little under one hundred fifty grand. One hundred and fifty grand, and my office overhead costs twenty eight. And that's not counting the 10%, the million dollars in down payments I collected this year. That's just the cash flow. Wow. I collected at least 10% down. And, and so the moral of the story is you should do less and make more. It's been said a lot, but you know, and I've heard this and we all hear this BS and you know, yeah, that's just B that's a sales pitch. Right. And then until, until you do it or until you see it live in your own life, and then you start to own the concept in your heart. And that's what makes a difference. You know, here's one, you don't need money to make money. If you're a new guy out there listening to that, you probably think I'm full of crap. It's not. And the first time that you make a deal with none of your own money and you make 15, 20 grand, then you're going to own that concept right here where it counts. Sure. So it's real easy for lips to say these words and your ears to hear them. But the, the difference is owning the concept in your heart. Once I figured out, I read nothing down by Robert Allen. And it took me seven years before I owned the concept on heart because it took me seven years to actually stumble around buying a uh, uh, I negotiated a deal with no payment and no down payment and no payments for two years. Because I didn't have anything, so I learned I got ballsy enough to make the offer that would suit me, broke me from Robert Allen. And I started making offers that suited me because I had no money. They were pretty crappy offers. And someone said yes. And that's the day I said, you know, if being broke, if you can do this business being broke, I got enough brokenness to buy this whole town. And I went out <laughs> and started because once you figure out you don't need money, what you are when you don't have money is your professional deal writer, contract writer upper. Is that a word? Yep, sure is. Just made it up. It's awesome. Yeah. So <laughs> when you don't have money, you're a, you're a professional deal maker, contract writer. And if you're really good at striking good deals and getting people to sign the contract that gives you those rights for a month or two months to strike at that price, then you're in the money. The most right. important thing in this whole business is the contract, not the money. It's right. the damn contract where you're buying something 50 cents on the dollar. So if you don't have money, learn how to write a contract and how to negotiate. Spend all your money in negotiation school. Spend all your money, someone's showing you in your state or your city how to write an effective real estate purchase contract. Right, right. That's brilliant. That's absolutely brilliant. And that applies not just to the residential business, but but really anything um, in business in general, but also, you know, on the commercial side. Okay, so, so. now I digress. We're going to go back to this. I'm kind of ADD. If it's you know okay. It. It's okay. I'll, I'll help keep you on track. You guys, uh, you have not, so you've bought an incredible number of homes. Uh, you've also, you mentioned self-storage. So do you still own self-storage? Well, hold on. I, I want to digress to the to, to, to the scaling part because that's what your show's about. That's correct. What, what made the scaling work the, the sixth time I tried to scale and really did a business that I work on and not in, okay, mm -hmm. what made it work was I stepped away from my business and I didn't care if I bought one house that year. I ended up only buying 33 houses that year that I was working on the business and they just walked in the door and fell down on my desk, okay? I didn't go looking for any. The, the problem was before, the reason why I failed all those other times, those five times, was because I never gave myself permission not to buy five houses. I mean, not to buy 100 houses a year. Right, I right. was trying to scale a business and learn how to fix a business in the time I had left over and in the emotion and in the heart and in the drive I had left over after buying 100 houses a year. But there was nothing of me left. Right. Right. You're, you're flying the plane. You're building the plane while you're flying it. And it's impossible. Yeah, and, it, and it wouldn't get off the ground. Right. Right. So right. That was when I look back, that was a, two things, three things. One is I went to meet with people and paid to meet with people that had already accomplished what I wanted to accomplish mm -hmm. in exactly my field, doing exactly what I do. Right. Number two, I gave myself permission to work on my business that year and nothing else. And number three, I quit trying to hire people and I started I mean, I quit trying to cultivate people and train people, and I started just stealing the best I could. And I call it whatever you want to call it, hiring away, offering them a promotion to come work for me. I mean, I figured out who the best in the business were, and I went and got them. It's not a crime. 
And, you know, I mean, that's that's and, part of it. So, and you know, what happened was the extra added benefit is I got their network and their knowledge and all their connections. When you're trying to cult- cultivate someone from the grassroots who doesn't know anything about your business, they don't they're not bringing anything to the table. It was amazing. Not only does people know what to do, but they knew people in high places. Right, right. That's awesome. Mitch, we're, we're out of time. Uh, I want to get to the final four questions if we can. So it, one of, of, I've loved this interview and, and, I, and we could go on, I think for a long time, because because you've got a wealth of wisdom. Uh, we'll get to the final four questions. I want you to talk a little bit about your books and how people can find you. We'll get to that. be the last question, but let's start right at the top uh, investing in bigger assets. And you kind of gave these three points already, but I wonder if you could distill everything, you know, into one piece of advice and you're going to give this to an aspiring investor. What would that single piece of advice be? You move to a bigger class when you're ready, when your business says you're ready. You don't gamble on a move to something that's that, that if, it, if you can't handle, it's going to squash in and ruin everything you've done this far. Like I didn't, you know, my first storages were little mom and pop, 50 units, 18 units, 20 units. Today, I, I'm building 363 units and two, 2.5 million, but I got the money. And I don't right. need anybody. And, 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 I'll, and, and, and if times get tough or it takes longer or it costs more than I thought, I got it. Right, Just, right. You progress as your business and your, and your bank accounts and your cash flow say you can. And gotcha. don't gamble. Gotcha. Investing in yourself. What's one thing you do to stay on top of your game? Health health. Today, I say that I, I was so out of balance for many, many, many years of life. I've lost 55 pounds. I quit smoking and drinking. I went from size 36 waist to 30. Uh, my neck's two inches smaller than it was a year ago. Um, I feel good. I, you know, it's a, probably an age thing. I'm about to turn 60. Uh, when we're young, full of piss and vinegar, you know, you think you're invincible, but believe me, this little thing, that our soul is tucked inside of, it's gotta be taken care of or it will fall down. Right, so it sounds like health. Health, taking care of your health is, is one of the things that you do to stay on top of your game. Yeah, I, I take care of my health and I, I should have been much more balanced way, way, way mm. earlier in my life, but I wasn't. Gotcha. Investing in the world, what's one thing you do to make the world a better place? I don't know if I help the world, but I can help my nation or I can at least help my local community. What I do is I make renters uh, into owners. I make uh, crappy neighborhoods into nice neighborhoods. I make tiny little tax assessments on crack houses into big tax assessments on nice new houses. So the municipalities and the schools get funding, you know, we should get a plaque for what we do at the city. Instead, we get more regulation and more bullshit, you know, and here we are changing the inner city, changing um, taxable income, changing lives, you know, changing the value of neighborhoods upward and better, right? you know, and and there's just no, there's no reward for it except for the money. No, there's, there's, there, there's certainly, yeah, you're, um, you're, you're on no one's favorite list, uh, unfortunately, and they don't, you know, typically see the value. I will tell you the, the, the reason why you do it is when like I sold a mobile home one time to a, to, to a guy and I was trying to talk, this guy, Carlos Bolito, and to be in my partner, who was a very wealthy man. And, and um, he lived in the, the Dominion and dealing in mobile homes was the, the minimum. And so uh, the first time I said, I said, I, let's do one house with me. He did one house with me. I said, Let, I got to go deliver the keys to these people at the mobile home park. So I handed him the deal, the keys. And then I was about to pull off when they started hugging each other and crying. And I said, hey, Carlos, look at that. And he goes, what's the matter? What's the matter? Why are they crying? He thought there was something wrong. I said, they're happy, Carlos. I said that, I said, they bought a mobile home on a rented lot in a mobile home park and they're crying because it's their first home and they're so happy. That's awesome. He said, That's okay, awesome. I want in this business. Right. Right. I said, you know, not everyone lives in a mansion. Some people come from places where there's dirt floors and no glass in their windows. Right. Right. That, that, that's, yeah, that's fantastic. And that, that's such a, such a, a great reward. Uh, how can people learn more about you and get in touch with you? And also, can you tell us about your book series? And yeah, sure. yeah. you go to 1000 houses.com one zero 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 houses.com. You can find everything there from my podcast to my books, to the courses or training or whatever it is you want to do. I have a book series called my life in a thousand houses. Um, 
all my books start with my life in a thousand houses and then they're separated by the subtitle failing forward to financial freedom is an entertaining story about how a dumbass learned how to make some money and rinse and repeat for a long time. Uh, I was truly probably one of the dumbest people on the planet, but I was resilient and I could learn from pain very well. Mm. I also tried to rinse and repeat things that were pleasurable. I, I, two things that stood out. If it was painful, it stood out and I didn't want it to happen. If it was pleasurable, it stood out and I was trying to figure out how to duplicate it. Sure, sure. My life in a thousand houses, 200 plus ways to find bargain properties. And my life in a thousand houses, the art of owner financing. All of them are at 1000houses.com along with blogs and podcasts and you name it. I got a ton of free stuff over there, ton. All the gurus out there chastise me. They say, you know, I give away the farm. I say, you know what? If people can go do it on their own, great. The smart ones will know uh, you're either going to pay the street or you're going to pay a coach. If I'm the right guy for you, call me. We'll have a conversation. We'll decide if I'm the right guy because I'm not taking on just anybody either. If I'm not going to, I don't want to play for the Cleveland Browns, man. I want to play for the, the the next guy that has a chance to win the Super Bowl. You know? Bitch, thank you so much for coming on today. It was an absolute pleasure entering, interviewing you. I look forward to doing it again here uh, sometime soon. You have a great rest of your day. Hey, let's do it again. We'll have a part B, okay? Sounds great. Thanks, Mitch. Take it easy.